Well, hi everyone. Welcome to the seminar today. And we have our very own Sharon Wang, who is here to tell us about precise radial velocities. Uh, Sharon uh, completed her undergraduate studies at Tsinghua University in uh, China, and then she came to Pennsylvania State University, three and a half hours or so from here, uh, to do her PhD with Jason Wright working on all of the ways to improve uh, precision radial velocity measurements, although she also harbors a not so secret interest in, brown, in uh, black holes and galaxy evolution as well, um, which she may get to explore as part of the academic freedom that she has to do whatever science she's interested in at DTM. I also came with a passion for black holes and galaxy evolution, but I completely abandoned it. <laughs> However, I encourage her not to follow that. <laughs> Um, while she was at Penn State, she was a, gra a NASA graduate science fellow and won a couple of prizes for her outstanding research as a graduate student, and we're delighted that she decided to join us at DTN last fall. She's working most closely, of course, on radial velocity things with Paul Butler, but he is starting radial velocity observations in Chile tonight, and uh, hence my privilege in getting to introduce <laughs> So, uh, we look forward to your talk. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Alright, thanks. So, let me explain the title first, Finding Terrestrial Exoplanets with Precise Radial Velocities. So the title is really a snapshot of our current status in answering a much bigger question, which is the ultimate motivation behind this talk, that is, is there another planet like our Earth? So this is what motivates me to come to work every day and keep me awake at night. So those of you who, especially the geologists in the audience who study the actual Earth, will understand that this is a very broad, convolved, and a vague question. So let me confine it down to what I mean, which is we want to know whether there, is, there are planets with Earth's radius and mass and orbiting around Sun-like stars near one astronomical unit. That's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And this is actually a pretty lofty goal. And that's the goal of the, one of the big goals of the community in the coming decade. But for now, what we can have is something of a compromise, which is to find exoplanets with radius and mass similar to the Earth. I can leave with you know, a little bigger Earth siblings instead of Earth strings. And obviously the host stars habitable zone. That is not too close that the planet will have runaway greenhouse effect, and nor too far away that water will freeze out. And I've uh, eliminated the confinement of around sun-like stars uh, to any kind of stars. So how do we discover exoplanets? So as of today, the vast majority of exoplanets were discovered by these two methods, the radial velocity method and the transit method. The radial velocity method uses the, the fact that the unseen planet gravitationally pulls its host star, so the star wobbles in the sky, and it has a net radial velocity along our line of sight. And this net radial velocity will create a Doppler effect of light, and what we measure is the Doppler shift of the star. And that gives us its radial velocity, and then reveals existence of planets. And the transit method looks for transiting exoplanets, looks for the periodic deeming of the star as the planets uh, across the star when it happens to move in front of the star, in between us and the star. So today's focus is, of course, the radial velocity method, or RV. That's the acronym of the talk, and that's my expertise. I use precise Doppler spectroscopy to measure the radial velocities of stars to look for or characterize planets, especially terrestrial planets. And radial velocity really had its glorious history. It discovered the very first planet in 1995, those two Swiss astronomers setting out to look for actually binary stars it, and it ended up finding something a little bit smaller. And that is the planet of 51 Pag B. And that is a hot Jupiter, which is a Jupiter-ish mass object uh, in a very, very short orbit around its host star, which surprised all astronomers because nothing like that existed in our, exists in our solar system. And very, very soon after the announcement of their discovery, Jeff Marcy and 
Paul Butler, this is our Paul 20 years ago. Uh, confirmed their results. It turns out the data existed in their disk all the time. They just didn't have the computing power to analyze the data. And they consequentially discovered the next nine exoplanets, including the first multiple planets, the first eccentric planets. And actually, they discovered the next seven, the, the first 70 of the first uh, 100 exoplanets, which is really impressive. And so, so radio velocity pretty much dominated the game of planet dis discovery for a decade. M vast majority of the first exoplanets were discovered by radio velocities, and the game changed when Kepler came along. Kepler is a satellite, is a space telescope launched by NASA aimed at looking for transiting planets, especially looking for Earth-like planets in the habitable zone of sun-like stars. And it completely revolutionized the field. This is a histogram of number of planets discovered in each year. As you can see, we got a slow start. And the dark blue are non-Kepler discoveries, most, mostly radio velocity discoveries. They are ramping up slowly. And when Kepler came along, everything just skyrocketed. And now we know exoplanets by the number of thousands. And this really enabled us to do statistical studies on exoplanets to understand their population, their formation, and to answer questions such as, what is the percentage of sun-like stars <coughs> that host Earth-like planets in their habitable zone? And it is estimated based on extrapolation of Kepler data that about 10 to 20 percent of sun-like stars should have a Earth-like planet in their habitable zone. That is a lot. So Kepler set out to find just such planets. Did Kepler find one? The answer is, like too many astronomical questions, sort of. <laughs> uh, it found the Earth's cousin, the Earth's older, bigger cousin, Kepler 452b. This is, in my opinion, the closest one to Earth-like planets we know today. It is a 1.6 Earth radius planet orbiting around a very much sun-like star. It's older than our sun, but the temperature and the size and the mass are very, very solar-like. It's on a 385-day period. It, it, it's literally just, you know, in, right in the middle of the habitable zone. In principle, it should have liquid water, except except the radius is just a little bit embarrassingly large. So 1.6 Earth radii, according to the interior composition study experts, uh, has a pretty large chance of being gaseous or icy like, like our Neptune, instead of being rocky like our Earth. There is literally a paper by one of the top experts in the field titled, Most 1.0 Earth radius planets are not rocky. So this is very embarrassing. Would it be nice if we can just measure the radio velocity of this planet, of the star, and get the gravitational pull of the planet and know its mass. But we can't, because our precision is not there yet. It is estimated that Kepler 452b will induce a radio velocity amplitude on its whole star below half meter per second. But this is where we stand today. Our current RV precision is only one to two meter per second. I'm not saying it's bad. Paul and colleagues worked very hard to achieve this precision. This is a plot of the velocity semi amplitude of the discovered planets uh, or measured planets as a function of the date of the year. As you can see, we started around the hundreds and came down in a decade down two orders of magnitude and order magnitude to about one to two meters per, per second, but we plateaued pretty much for the past decade at essentially two meters per second, except for a handful of very bright stars for which we have hundreds of observations and they're very, very special, very quiet, well-behaved stars. And this is just not nearly enough. We're not gonna get another Kepler-like satellite in the next decade so radio velocity has this uh, unique opportunity to find the next Earth, only if we can improve our radio velocity precision. It is very important for the quest of Earth-like planets, terrestrial planets in the habitable zone, uh, 
to improve our reduced velocity precision. This is a graph of the stellar temperature, hot stars, cool stars. The sun is over here as a function of orbital period of the planet. And here are some discovered planets to date. And the blue belt going across the plot is the habitable zone of the host star. The red one is like the extended one, but it's probably too dry there. Um, the important one uh, signature on the plot are those white lines cutting across the plot. They are marking the radial velocity amplitude of a planet with Earth's mass. So you can see Earth is over here. It has a radial velocity amplitude of less than 10 centimeters per second. That's an order of magnitude low, higher than the precision we have today. And that's what the community is pushing for in the, next, in the near future and coming decades. And you can get away with, a, with one meter per second also around here, around the very cool stars, what we call the M dwarfs. They're about one meter per second around here, and that's how we discovered Proxima b. So that star is around a very small and cool star, not sunlight, but it's in, in the habitable zone. That's what we can do today. We would like to push this further. And I want to emphasize that it's not only about finding the Holy Grail, the Earth's twin or sibling or cousins. It's also about gathering a solid data set for understand the planet population. This is one example. Kepler has shown us that there is, there are, there is a large population of what we call the super Earths or sub-Neptunes. Uh, that is planets with radius between the size of Mercury and Earth and Neptune, for which our solar system <coughs> does not have an analog for it. It is estimated that about half of the stars host at least one such planet. There are tons and tons of them out there, but we don't know whether they're rocky like Earth or icy like Neptune, unless we have both their radius and their mass. And this is a plot of planet radius and planet mass of those small planets uh, with well-measured mass. As, you, uh, as I, I mentioned, it's very challenging to measure the mass of small planets because they're so tiny. And as you can see, all the small planets, the, appear to be rocky, consistent with the blue line, which is the Earth's bulk composition, which is nice and interesting. But if you plot the entire data set available, <laughs> this is the reality we're dealing with today, you cannot really <coughs> draw detailed conclusions on population based on this kind of data. So we really need to push through the velocity precision to effectively conduct surveys to gather a good sample of planets to understand the, their composition and thus their population characteristics and their formation eventually. So why is it so hard? Which is a question I ponder uh, very often late at night when I was a grad student. And I came to the conclusion, as everybody else in the field, that it is just hard. It's just a hard game. So to understand why it is so hard, let's start with a crash course on precise Doppler spectroscopy. So measuring radio velocity is really measuring the wavelength shifts of the stellar spectrum. You take one spectrum of, spectrum of the star at T0, you register its wavelengths on your CCD pixels, you come back and visit the star again at a different time, T equals TE, and you see the lines have shifted. And you can measure the amount of shift in the wavelengths, and that gives you the radio velocity. You do it over and over again. You accumulate an RV time series, and you can analyze your data and detect planets. Easy enough, except when you realize that one meter per second means one thousandth of a pixel shift on your CCD. So this is a real spectrum. One, each dot is the uh, flux in each pixel, and what we're measuring, if you, you want to do one meter per second, is one thousandth of a shift, of a pixel shift. We, we are able to achieve one to two meter per second because we have uh, you know, thousands of pixels, a decent chunk of the star. But we want to push this to an order of magnitude higher. So what can we do? If we break down the problem, 
you realize there are roughly seven components of imprecise read velocity. And it, it's like holding down a big aero budget tent. You know, you have nuts and bolts and screws to hold the tent down so it doesn't blow off. And you really need to hammer each term down to bring the entire aero budget down. So there are roughly seven terms divided into three categories. The first is astrophysics, choice of star. You don't want stars that are too hot, that you don't get many deep spectral lines or fast rotators, then you're kind of hopeless because there is just not enough Doppler information there. And you want to know how to deal with this thing called stellar jitter. That is the radio velocity induced by star, the star itself. For example, our sun pulses at a period of about five minutes. This is what we call the heartbeat of the sun. And this pulsation induces a radio velocity amplitude of larger than a meter per second. So you really want to deal with that. And that's just one example of what the stars can do. And then we have to deal with the hardware, the spectrograph you use to measure the spect stellar spectrum. And throughout the years, we figure out that we want a stable light input. You don't want the, the star to dance around. You, do, you want an even smear of the light when you feed it into your instrument. So we, we figure out we want octagonal fibers, double scramblers, and all kind of fancy toys. And we wa also really want a stable spectrograph. That means control the temperature and pressure to below 100 parts per million. So now the next, all the next generation spectrographs are going to be in this fancy vacuum sealed cryogenic uh, the environment. And you also want a key gas wavelength calibrator. In the end, what you're measuring are the wavelengths of the stars. And Paul has been using iodine cell. I don't know if you've seen those. Uh, they look kind of pinkish with some iodine molecules in the glass shell. And throughout the years, we figure out the best calibration is uh, laser frequency cones. Those are just rock steady, good to below a centimeter per second, probably. And then there's a software uh, aspect. You have to think of ways of mitigating the atmosphere, uh, atmospheric absorption lines. That's the spectral contamination in your measured cell spectrum. Uh, unless you want to go up to space, which we're also exploring now as an option. Uh, and you also want to do very carefully your data analysis, which is what, what Paul is very good at. And he's basically the only person in the world who can bring the radio velocity precision to a meter per second with, with them cells. So those are the seven components. And I'm just going to give you one example of these seven problems. I specialize mostly in this department. Uh, on our battle with the Tulerix. This is part of my thesis, and this illustrates sort of the challenges we're facing in this game. So we set out with the motivation to try to improve the radio velocity precision of this one particular instrument. It is the high resolution in shell spectrometer on the Keck telescope, so Keck Harris. Keck is the only northern large telescope with one to two radio velocity precision. And it is the workhorse behind measuring those masses I showed you of those super Earths and sub -nephews. Essentially, almost all the work was done by Keck. And it's the leading instrument in discovering terrestrial planets. But this is the precision. This is a radio velocity plot of what we call a radial velocity standard star. So the star is quiet, it probably doesn't have planets we can detect. <coughs> it should be just flat. And the x-axis is roughly time of the year of your observation. And you see this weird trend which correlates with time of year. You're detecting the Earth, essentially, as Earth revolves around the sun. Um, and it has amplitude of larger than a meter per second. This is very embarrassing. And the RMS is well over two meter per second. So this is how well we can do on a supposed to be rock steady star. So what is going on? Well, we firstly suspected the Tulerik lines. So this is spectrum of the Earth's atmospheric absorption lines, which I'll call Tulerics, from optical 
500 nanometer or so to near infrared, one, one micrometer wavelengths, and so on. And CAT operates in this wavelength regime, 500 to 600 nanometer. As you can see, you don't really see any atmospheric absorption. Why do we worry about this? Well, unless you zoom in, this is 500 to, 6, 500 to 620 nanometer. Toluric lines are everywhere, mostly water lines. Of the depths of 1% or even you know, higher, it depends on your humidity or your site. And if you're measuring 1,000th of a pixel shift, this could really matter. But there are also other factors which can affect your radio velocity precision. So to isolate the effects of telluric contamination and to see whether that's behind the one meter per second systematic arrow, we run some simulations. So this is a, resu the, a result from the simulation. For a world without atmosphere, if you run your code through simulated spectral with your observed signal noise, you should be getting this. It's a little above one meter per second, which is mostly limited by the photon noise and how good your code is, which we discovered tons and I promise you Paul and I will work hard on it. Uh, and if you inject telluric absorption lines and get the radio velocities and compare the two, this is the difference. So this is the net effects of telluric contamination. As you can see, you don't really see many wiggles. The effects are probably small, on the order of 20 meters per second in terms of amplitude, but it does add noise. It adds an additional scatter to our radio velocity on the order of larger than half meter per second. So this is our poster child standard star. This is just another standard star. They tell basically the same story. So telurics are really bad if you want to detect Earth, because 20 centimeters per second, half meter per second is not good enough. But it's not behind that large wiggle, which by the way, we have found the cause of that, that large wiggle, but it's very technical, it's missing numerical errors, which I will not get into. But telurics are bad enough already if you want to detect first twin or siblings. So we have to deal with it. Well, luckily, it looks like we can deal with it, deal with it pretty well, thanks to the shallow lines in the optical region we're talking about. So this is a plot of the radio velocity scatter. So this is the 1.26 photon noise and numerical error floor. If you e totally ignoring telurics, you don't model it, you model it to 0%, you're adding an additional noise of 62 centimeter per second, more than a half meter. If you just model it to about half precision, like half the depth you should be getting, you, you're, you're halfway there. And of course, you if you can model your telurics in your code perfectly to what it looks like in reality, you get rid of it completely. But really, in reality, we just want to control it down to below 10 centimeter per second, or maybe five, ideally. And 90% of the way there is enough. And modeling those absorption lines to 90% precision is no brainer. It's very easy. So this is very comforting. But mitigating telurics is more important for detecting planets around cool stars. Cool stars such as Proxima Centauri and Trappist 1, as you probably heard in the news. Those are the two poster child children these days for uh, terrestrial planets in the habitable zone around cool stars. So why mitigating telluric lines are important for cool stars? It's because cool stars are red. So this is a, a spectral energy distribution as a function of wavelengths for different types of stars. The blue and black and the orange are sort of the sun-like stars. And the red is a cool star, what we call the M dwarfs. Proxima Sen is something similar. As you can see, the peak is really near one micrometer. And if you recall the spectrum of the telluric lines, you don't have much in the optical where it's best to observe sun-like stars. But if you move to the near infrared, you're entering the deep zone of water absorption lines and oxygen and even methane as you go redder. And those lines, a very challenging to model. 
Um, I chaired a session almost two years ago at our the, the meeting of our community, the Extreme Precise Video Velocity meeting, and we came to the conclusion that this is one of the largest bottlenecks in getting precise radio velocity in the near infrared. And to move forward, one of the crucial things is to get more lab measurements of water lines, of the wavelengths of those lines, the shape of these lines, the depths of these lines, and all of these as a function of temperature and pressure. Who would have thought that finding terrestrial planets around cool stars is closely linked to lab measurements, precise lab measurements of water absorption lines on the Earth. So this is just one snapshot of the many, many challenges we're face facing in this game. You never know where it leads you and what, you ne what needs to be done. And speaking of cool stars, as I mentioned when we were looking at this plot, you don't need the, the 10 centimeter per second precision to detect habitable zone planet around the cool stars. And this we can achieve probably in the near future. And this is really, the very near future in the next couple of years is really gonna be the golden age for detecting planets around cool stars. They have a large radio velocity signal and they also have a large transit signal. And this brings us to the next Kepler-ish satellite test the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is scheduled to be launched early next year. Not delay it again, please. Um, it's, it's unlike Kepler, Kepler looks at stars that are far away. TESS is going to do an all-sky survey targeting primarily stars nearby. And if you do a volume-limited survey and just count the stars, 70% of the stars in our solar neighborhood are cool stars. So TESS is going to provide, provide us thousands of planet candidates around nearby stars. And many of them will be in the habitable zone of their host stars, primarily those cool stars. And we at Carnegie really have the right tools for, for following up the planet candidates detected by TESS, or just look out uh, to search for these planets on our own. So our tour is the Magellan Telescope in South American Chile, in Chile, where that's where Paul's at. He's uh, doing an observer run, observing <coughs> run, using the Planet Finder Spectrograph, or PFS, on Magellan. Um, what's special about PFS, and distinguish it from other spectrograph, is that it has a very high sampling rate on the CCD, which is very important for m dwarfs for the cool stars because their spectra are extra wiggly. So you, we want, you want to get a better grasp of what, how the wiggles go. You don't want to undersample them. And this summer, our spectrograph PFS is getting an upgrade. It's gonna have a new CCD, which will up the sampling by even more, by almost 70%. And it'll have the, the best sampling of, among any precision spectrograph in the world and it's going to get a fiber feed. As I mentioned, the st stable input is very important for your spectrograph, and this will help a lot with the precision. We estimate that we should be able to get half meter per second precision or even below with the upgrade. Depends on the star. So that's great. That's what we can do in the very near future, in this coming year and the next. So, but what are we doing now? There are a lot of things we can do before the PFS upgrade and before test launches. One of them is to practice for looking for test planets. And that's what we, we are doing now with our PFS plus K2 campaign. So K2 is the acronym for Kepler-2. That's the extended mission of Kepler with limited capabilities. We're following up two targets discovered by K2, two very interesting planets. Um, and this is our amazing team. This is the project led by me and Fei Dai, who is a grad student at MIT. And we got the top help uh, from Andrew Vandenberg and he analyzing the K2 light curves, the transiting signals, and Johanna Taski, 
Uh, our own Johanna and also Jennifer Bird from MIT are also involved in this effort. And Paul should be looking at our stars tonight, hopefully. Um, so we are looking at two targets this semester. Uh, those targets are interesting on their own. And we are also doing this test to see how efficient we can do this kind of game to measure the mass of those planets discovered by transit satellite. Target number one is a Neptune-ish planet around a sun-like twin star. So you might have seen this photo in one of the Carnegie News. This is a system, uh, this is a different system, but a very similar one to our target number one, HD133131 AB. It, this is a sun-like twin star, and Johanna, using the data taken through PFS, has discovered three Jovian Jupiter-like planets around those two stars. And the target number one we're following are just like this. Those twin stars are very interesting because they should be born at the same place in the same time. They have basically the same temperature and mass and metallicity and age. So the diversity in the planets in these systems is very interesting. And this one has a short period Neptune of, around one of these stars, and the other star doesn't have a transiting planet. And Johanna's system doesn't even have a short period Neptune planet, otherwise we would have seen it in the radio velocities. So this is target number one, very interesting to follow up. Target number two is an ultra-short period super-Earth. So it has a radius of about 1.7 Earth radius. We're trying to see if it has a rocky composition by measuring its, its mass. Its mass. Um, this is a plot of Earth's density, of density scaled to the Earth as a function of period. <coughs> and ultra short period planets are defined as planets with orbital period uh, below a day. So they orbit around their star less than a day, uh, once, once less than a day. Then this orange dot is our tentative measurement for this ultra short period super Earth, which is consistent with the previous handful. As you remember, every everybody uh, with about below 1.6 Earth radius seems to have a rocky composition, and this one seems uh, to be just the same. So this would be another interesting super Earth sample. And more interestingly, it seems like this system might have a non-transiting companion, which we're really trying to pin down at the moment. And that's why we ask for a lot of telescope time on Magellan. So those are our two exciting targets. Excuse me? Yes? What kind of composition could give you a planet 20 times the density of the Earth? Oh, I know. Um, so <laughs> Made of uranium or something? So the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> um, so some of them, so I looked into this. Some of them just have really large error bars, and they could be underestimated. Some of them are pretty solid detection. They are truly ultra, this is what we call the ultra-dense planets. And, and we don't know where they came from or what kind of composition. Maybe they're blown cores of massive things. And they're just really, really dense. I don't know, or maybe something else is going on that prohibited us from measuring a precise ma ma mass of the system. Yeah, but those measurements are pretty solid. According to my um, so yeah. But it's also very interesting that if those are blown out cores of larger things, then why don't you see those in very short orbit? Right? Those are the closest, the planets, to the star that has more stellar irradiation than those ones, yet they seem to be just migrated rocky planets. So that's one of the questions we're trying to answer is whether those sub-Neptunes and super-Earths are just cores of larger things or do they form as rocky just as they were, but migrated back and forth. Another project that I'm pursuing um, is PFS observation on cool stars. We have been following many, many targets uh, for more than 10 years now with PFS. And some of them, it seems like, we can claim a solid detection of planets. 
especially some uh, interesting planets around, potential planets around cool stars that could be in their habitable zone. Um, and when the system is ready to publish, we call it they're cooked. So this particular project is aiming at cooking these targets by just observing them more frequently than we normally would. Uh, we, we try to close cases with high cadence observations. This is one example of such system. It's, it's a cool star in Amdor. It has a tentative signal. This is a pure autogram. It's like a power, power spectrum. Tentative signal at two days and 116 days, but they only cross the 5% force along probability. And it's just not there yet for the 1%, which you can pretty much claim detection. So we're, we're gathering more observations to see if we can pin down these two planets. And it'll be very interesting because 116 days, that's in the habitable zone of this cool star. So a short period, one, and the outer super is in the habitable zone. Yes? Just looking at that data, the scatter is much larger than the error bars. So are you really sure there's any signal there? We're not. That's why it's 5%. Well, I'm saying just looking at the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is quite, I agree, it's quite optimistic. And one of the reasons is that cool stars are challenging. They are fully convective stars. So they have more stellar jitter. The star itself is not as quiet as the sun. So, and those two plots are just simply folding the radio velocity curves to the period of the punitive planets without doing anything about the stellar jitter. Okay, about so the stellar jitter. Yeah, no, no, no. So, so if we want to claim detection of these two systems, we gotta get more data, the high cadence data, better sampling will get give us a better grasp of the stellar jitter, and we'll be able to uh, hopefully model things out. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't know. Maybe this is a rotation period. That's the fear. If this is just some some alias of the rotation of the star, then it'll be pretty disappointing. But that's why you need high cadence data. Because you just either kill this or confirm this, or give you more power to model it, so that when the new PFS comes online, <coughs> you know that we're going to give this target high priority, because we want to cook it as soon as possible. How about the future? So what are we going to do in the future? Uh, besides the upgrade of PFS, which is very important, and Paul and I am sure are going to spend long hours this summer to make sure this thing works. There are a lot of exciting future opportunities in the near future and coming decades. This is the same plot of the radio velocity summer amplitude vs the date. And now we have instruments and their starting date and their rough precision plotted over here. I've worked with Keck Harris, ATDHRS, very sad story, but fun. Uh, upgraded Keck Harris, PFS came just uh, in about 2010 and 11, half south and north are the leading instruments by the Europeans. And in the near future, PFS is getting an upgrade, HRS is getting an upgrade, aiming at one meter per second <coughs> or lower. And we, in North America, we also have Minerva and MUID. Minerva is now finally, as of last week, up and running. Uh, we are in full commissioning, transitioning into full survey mode very soon. I'm involved with both Minerva and New, so I'm going to talk a little bit about these two. Carmenes is the first dual channel spectrograph in both optical and near infrared, but this is built up by our European colleagues, and Espresso is scheduled to uh, commission next year. This is aiming at even higher precision to find the true Earth twin. So our European colleagues are really taking a lead in this field, and we're trying very hard to catch up. So now I'm going to talk about Minerva and Nuit a little bit. I'm a team member on both projects. Uh, both projects. Minerva is an array of 4.7 meter telescopes. So th those are four telescopes. Each is 0.7 meter in aperture. The reason for this choice, instead of buying just a 2 meter telescope, is because the cost is an order mag almost an order magnitude lower if you do, the, do, do, do it this way instead of having a large telescope. 
Um, the selling point for Minerva is that we literally own those four telescopes. We have 100% of the time on this telescope. So in, for comparison, for PFS on Magellan, on a, in a good year, we get about 16 nights <coughs> per year. But this, we have 365 nights, uh, minus the weathered out nights. And this will give you high cadence velocities. And it also has a semi-stabilized spectrograph that is capable of doing below one meter per second. So with such high cadence and such high precision, we will be able to detect Earth-like planets on short orbits, and we're aiming at a handful of very carefully selected cool stars. And it is estimated that we should be able to find about 15 super-Earths in the habitable zone of these stars for three years of Monora survey, which began right now. So that's very exciting. I'm, I'm trying to uh, bring the precision to where it should be right now. And I have Paul next to my office, so we got extra help. So I'm pretty confident we'll be able to reach this goal in the very near future, hopefully in a month or so. Uh, and NUID is an even more ambitious uh, instrument. This is an instrument founded by NASA because after the discoveries of Kepler, NASA suddenly realized, wait a second, we don't ha actually have enough power on the ground to characterize those planets Kepler found. So they founded this spectrograph on the 4 meter wind telescope uh, in Kitt Peak. And this is the spectrograph aiming at about 20 to 30 centimeter per second. And they're, they're, they're aiming to start commissioning the instrument in late 2018. That's very ambitious for the budget and the, the timeline. So this is what NUID will be able to do. By the way, the, the, the name NUID came from the Native American uh, language uh, for the Tuaho uh, Aboriginals who own the mountain, the telescope, reside. And that it means to see or to visualize in their language. So this is a tribute uh, to them. And this is what NUID is going to do. This is, again, the temperature and period of planets, habitable zone. With five nights per year, here it will be discovered planets along this line and below. With 30 nights, we will be able to detect habitable zone planets <coughs> around sun-ish stars, cooler than the sun. And with 50 nights per year, which is almost the minimum new it is gonna get, we will be able to detect habitable zone planets around even uh, stars even more like uh, similar to the sun, and we'll be able to follow up a lot of the target detected by TESS. So this is the sensitivity curve for TESS, 20, 20 days period or 200 day period. So new it is gonna be great. And uh, uh, the instrument is being built right now, and even before the instrument is being built, we're already start writing the software. We're doing the, everything the right way this time. Instead of creating a huge software that nobody can use and understand, we're assembling a team of astronomers and professional software writers and software engineers uh, to do this the right way. Because nobody has demonstrated that you can do 10 centimeters per second with your code. Which brings us back to the seven components of Precise RV. So I've mentioned those exciting new hardware, <coughs> which will hammer this down to well below 10 centimeters per second. And I've mentioned Telurix. How about data analysis? So for spectrographs calibrated by those Aldan absorption cells, almost all spectrographs in the world use the code that Paul wrote two decades ago. And that code is written for those computers. <laughs> it is still the best code in the world. Paul has tweaked it here and there in many, many places uh, through the, throughout the years to improve it. And then he really brought it down from 3 meters per second to 1 meter per second. But still, this is what it looks like. If you open up a code and you see the documentation session, you can see you know, Jeff Marcy. Paul, Paul created it, and Jeff Marcy motivated it, and Paul did a bunch of work on this. Mm -hmm attempting to modify it to improve it. This is really, really old. Can we do better? The answer is easily yes. And that's part of the reason I'm here. Uh, because Pa is next to my office, I get to take a lot of shortcuts. 
uh, instead of trial and error and trial and error endlessly, I can just ask Paul, Paul, have you tried this? Does this make sense? And this is what we think the future. We're not going to do the, the new code in IDL, which is, if you've never heard of IDL, that's not her fault at all. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna do it in Python, so our future graduate student can actually get something out of it. We're gonna <laughs> put it on GitHub, so it's easy to manage, version controlled, and shareable among the entire community. And we're gonna use some fancy Bayesian statistics, so we finally get some error bars that make sense. Connell make the, the very insightful comments that you're scattered around those RV plot, they look kind of larger than the actual error bars which is sort of the hidden secret in the community. Everybody has underestimated their error bars by like 50 to 100 percent. That's, that's just sort of the industrial standard because what can you do to estimate er those error bars if you're using least chi square minimization to try on an error until you just find something that works. So this is, this, this new code is using MCMC and, uh, and uh, hammer and then it's going to incorporate this fancy thing called Ga Gaussian processes to to incorporate in those systematic errors that we don't understand and fold it into the error bar instead of just say two lyrics we don't know what to do uh, for example and this is an example of this new code at work at imp improving the precision of Minerva so this is this is a slice of the 2D and 1D posterior distributions of Three out of the seven parameters we're trying to optimize, and Minerva really has the least number of parameters among the spectrograph I've worked with. CAC has, for example, 15. Um, this is wavelength solution zero point, wavelength solution derivative. This is your radial velocity, and again, wavelength zero point, wavelength derivative. You can see they are nasty. The posterior space is nasty. You have this weird covariance and it's it's segmented and we're like what is going on well you're, you're just lucky that they are orthogonal to your radial velocity and that's why you'll be able to get the right answer roughly and do one to two meter per second so it turns out that we're just not defining some of the parameters properly and we're creating those weird structures in the posterior space and we tweaked it a little bit and now it's better much better looking, but what is this? This just looks too much of a covariance. It turns out we did not define wavelengths zero point at the center of the pixel, and then that creates weird covariance between the two, and we took that, and then now this is the real covariance between two parameters, which is what you expect uh, by the definitions of the, those parameters. Now you can really finally get a good posterior distribution get an unbiased measurement of radial velocities, and because you have posterior distribution, you have a good definition of an error bar. You, 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 you now know better how well you can measure your velocities. So this code is almost done. The only challenge is computational time. So Paul's code is old but fast. It's, it was written for the old computers, so it has to be efficient. And to reduce one stellar spectrum, pulse code takes about two to three minutes. Unfortunately, this one, for 15, seven to 15 parameters, it take, can take t from 10 minutes to hours. So we cannot do science within the lifetime of a grad student. Mm -hmm. And that is unacceptable. And we are, we are, we're thinking of ways to go around this, including combining pulse tricks with those MCMC hammer instead of just go full blown Bayesian. Um, and we'll see how it goes in the next uh, half year or so. And uh, for the last five minutes, um, we, so for the, for the past hour, we've talked about upgrade for our tools to hammering down the hardware components, upgrade to deal with tolerics and data analysis, so we can really control these components, but we really haven't talked about this component. What can we do about it? What is the right tools to deal with this? And this is actually the most scary term among all the error budget components. And this plot is what Paul calls a very scary plot. This is uh, different terms. This is radial velocity amplitude, one meter, two meter, three meters. 
One Earth's mass in habitable zone around solar and log has 8 cm per second amplitude. Earth around half solar mass Amdorf, cool star, 27 cm per second. The new spectrograph we're building aims at 30 cm per second or below, but the stellar jitter term, the radio velocities that are induced by the stars themselves, are typically in the order of magnitude larger. There is the gravitational redshift, there is the magnetic cycle, which will cause spots and plages on the surface. If you look at the image of the sun, you see those cool spots. And as the sun rotates, these, these will create nasty signals. There's flares in active outdoors, which people are also concerned because they might kill the habitability of uh, a, a, ha a planets around these stars. They can induce maybe a meter, maybe lower, nobody knows. That's the scary part. Um, I'm sorry, uh, I was talking about active regions when I said spots and plages. Magnetic cycle is something different. It's like the 11 year solar cycle that's similar to active region, but operates on years time scale, which will be pretty bad for detecting something on further away. And stellar oscillations, the solar heartbeat I mentioned, that's a few meters per second, and also something called granulation, that's when when the hot bubbly stuff coming out of the, the, the interior of the star, they, they carry uh, materials that just moving towards you or they sink down and will move below you. The, the difference in the velocities of those things will give you a few meters per second easily amplitude or 10 centimeters per second of the sun. So how are we going to deal with this? This is really, really hard. And this is an example of the best the community can do today. So this is using uh, contemporaneous photometry of the star, or it's the light a light curve of star flux, and also radio velocity roughly around the same epoch. And this star happened to be Kepler seventy eight, was the uh, host the first Earth density super Earth known. And you can see the amplitude, I, I, I eliminated those because those are too small. Those are about 10 meters per second. And the amplitude of the planet is two below 2 meters per second. How can you measure 2 meters per second amplitude in the existence of 10 meters per second stellar jitter? Well, you use something called Gaussian process regression. You model both processes, time series, as something called Gaussian processes, which is a sort of non-parametric uh, model to describe the variations of these things. You use the contemporaneous photometry to guide the velocities, and using that, we are able to reduce, uh, detect planets with below two meter per second amplitude with a star of 10 meter per second stellar jitter. And this is the almost the best case today we can do. And th those are on active stars. But for the sun, we want to go from a few meters per second to 10 centimeters per second. That's a different game. So this is a project that I proposed later last year to Kepler, and uh, now, like, which is due today, uh, to Keck, Harris. This project is aiming at understanding stellar jitter with the best photometric data and the, the best radio velocity data we can gather today and see just how well we can do, what kind of new tools we can come up with, what is the limitation if you have simultaneous space, best space photometry you can ever imagine today and the best cadence and precision on the ground in terms of radio velocity. So this is a network we're building with several precision radio velocity telescopes, and this one is in the near infrared. And with this data set, uh, with, with time scale coverage from minutes to hours to 80 days, this is the first time such data set is being gathered. And we have a team of world experts that will uh, using this data to attack the problem of stellar jitter. And I hope that in the near future, 
uh, the observation will happen uh, at end of this year and early next year. I hope that in the very, very near future, we will have a much better handle at stellar jitter because we cannot detect terrestrial planets without hammering the term jitter. And our project is going to address four out of the six terms in stellar jitter. And many of them for the very first time, for example, for granulation, nobody knows how to deal with them. And for flares in active M dwarf, so for those mini flares, nobody knows what their effects are or how to deal with them at all. So we're going to attack them for the very first time. If you have to take away one word from this talk, I hope you remember the word jitter. <laughs> jitter today is being regarded as the roadblock in our way to detect terrestrial planets in the habitable zone around stars. But five years, or maybe 10 years later, when we look back, it'll be just this large opportunity to understand astrophysics and to, to overcome this biggest roadblock we've ever seen for decades and to detect the true Earth's analog. So nobody panic. Mm -hmm. We got it covered. I want to end with the picture of some Proxima B and Kepler 452 and summary over here. And just to say that in the near future of two to three years and in the next decade, there will be more and more exciting discoveries just like this. Uh, I'm very optimistic that the whole RV community will be able to do it. Thank you. Okay, I'm really glad you're optimistic. That's always good because you've got a long career of bright uh, observations to make in front of you, so that's good. Are there questions for Sharon? Alan, you want to call on people? Yeah, you can call on people. Right. Alan. Uh, sure, that was an excellent talk. I, I just want to be up to date on some of the latest estimates on what the uh, frequency of Earth like planets are. And you gave an estimate of 20% based on Kepler extrapolations there. But an active group of uh, run by Russ Polakov, who's taken input from all sorts of different folks and used different ways of estimating and scaling the Kepler data. And believe it or not, they're coming up with a community-based best number of about 60%, with again, big error marks going down as low as 10%, but it's over 100%. So, uh, <laughs> oh my God. 10-40% is, is pessimistic these days. 60% is kind of in, in the sweet spot of where people are estimating. It is based on the you extrapolate, it's always dangerous, but uh, that's a pretty robust community-based number, so. I see. Thank it's you. Incredible number to think of. Thank you. Um, that sounds scary, though. <laughs> 60% plus minus a big error bar. Thanks. Yeah, I was advised, so we had a journal club discussion on the suite of papers um, estimating those things, and the advice I got was, Never put 60% in your proposals. <laughs> <coughs> well, this is about to be a number blessed by NASA. Oh, wow. Okay. They, they, want, they want to be optimistic. <laughs> they want to be optimistic. Okay. okay. So, what's your opinion, Alan? What would you put in your proposal? Uh, well, I don't propose anymore. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, good for you. I, I have to accept what other people say on this. You know, Wes Strahl had a number even higher. He's had some. That's awesome. I look forward to that. Thank hey, you. Um, you're mentioning that people need to do lab measurements to better understand the water lines. Is that are there groups that are doing that? And that uh, yeah. So, that? so the the one of the top experts in the world is um, the Hytron group in Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, I met them with them, and they continue to do these things. But they have many molecules to measure in many conditions. And the, the, the question is always, it's better to have funding for them so they have the personnel power and time to do this. So what we have done is, um, so Johnson Forney has written a white paper to uh, the funding agencies on the 
the things that the fundamental lab measurements that need to be done in order to better understand the planet atmospheres. For example, you can run clouds models and chemical reactions in the atmosphere, and we snuck in a section in there saying that water is very important <coughs> not only for understanding planet planet atmosphere but also for precise really velocity measurements. So that's what we're pushing for. Um, we're going to meet again this summer for the third extreme really velocity precision workshop. And I, I think we're probably going to write a white paper each thing again. Um, we'll probably reiterate the emphasis on modeling those lines and getting more lab measurements on those lines. So that's that's what's being done. We, we astronomers don't really go measure the measurements. So can you say a little bit more about the magic of Gaussian processes? Like what, what you need by way of input data to make that decorrelation work? So, um, so traditionally, you do a decorrelation. You model the, the photometry, the flux, as a function of, as a, the velocity as a linear function of the flux. And you say it's a almost one-on-one -on -one correlation. Uh, but Gaussian process is a couple of hyperparameters characterizing the process. And just say, this is the characterizing, ca characterize uh, char characteristic amplitude or period, and then with that, you have a probability of having your radial velocity being somewhere. So the the shaded curves are the probability distribution. So, but what of the so process? What so is a stochastic process? And the what yeah. precision do you need on your, say, photometry in order to get a corresponding sub-meter per second expectation on the radial velocity? That's the question that everybody wants to know. <laughs> so Kepler really offers the best precision photometry, right? So to answer questions like this, or, or do we really absolutely need simultaneous photometry is another question we're trying to answer. Is there spectroscopic signatures we, we can identify using the photometry so we can get rid of photometry in the future? So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. So for 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 tasks like this, obviously you don't need Kepler precision, which is like a hundred parts per million, and that's what we're doing now with PFS today. Actually, we have a the ultra short period one is a very active star of ten meter per second. Also, so we, we have three group uh, uh, um, three groups of people looking at the star with photometry with about about 0.1 percent precision because it varies around 1%. So that gets you from 10 meters to 2 meter. But nobody knows from 2 meter to 20 centimeter per second what you need. That I don't think could be even answered with the data set we're going to gather with Kepler and Keck. That's That will up to the future. We can probably do a little below a meter per second, I would say, if we have our heart. Okay, well, if there are no further questions, we'll stop and thank Sharon again. She'll be here for another couple yeah. of years, I hope, for <laughs> doing all these projects. So come talk to her. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's longer than I thought. I thought I would have like 15 minutes to talk about Dr.